Welcome, 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 welcome to another episode of the Pound for Pound Box Room Board. I'm your host, Michael. Uh, joining me this week live from the UK. Um, friend and fan of the Pound for Pound Boxing Report YouTube show and uh, podcast, Mr. Boxing Addict. How you doing, sir? Yeah, really good. Thanks, Michael. All right, all right. Uh, we're trying to get uh, D, a.k.a. Doodoo Brown, to join us. Uh, she keeps She's having computer issues on her end. Um, hopefully, she'll join us um, as, uh, throughout the sh um, She'll join us um, during the show. Uh, for those who are new to the Pound for Pound Box Report, the Pound for Pound Box Report is a live YouTube show slash blog slash podcast that discusses all things boxing. The model is when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When boxing is bad, we will talk about it. The bottom line is if it concerns boxing, we will talk about it. Um, if you want to find information about the Pound for Pound Box Report, there are a couple of main places you can go. You can go to the Pound for Pound Box Report blog page. The address for that is p4pboxingreport.wordpress.com. Let me repeat that, p4pboxreport.wordpress.com. On the blog page, you will not only have uh, links to previous episodes of the Pound for Pound Box Report YouTube and podcast, you also have links written by links, videos, um, articles written by yours truly. Um, you can also go to the podcast page and find information about the Pound for Pound Box Report. Uh, the link for that is p4pboxingreport.podomatic.com. Let me repeat that p 4 p report.podomatic.com. On the podcast page, you can find all previous episodes of Pound for Pound Box Report podcast um, on both the blog page and the boxing and the podcast page. Excuse me. You'll find links to where you find us all over social media on Facebook, on Tumblr, on Google Plus, on YouTube, Twitter. Uh, we got a Pinterest board. Um, Podomatic. We got an RSS feed if you want to subscribe to either the blog or the uh, podcast. Uh, we're on Stitcher Radio. Just go to stitcherradio.com. Just look up Pete Pound for Pound Box Report. That's P O U N D, the number four P O U N D Box Report. Or do a quick search of boxing and, should, and you should find it there. Um, be a friend, be a pal, be a buddy. Check us out on Stitcher Radio. Uh, and leave us a review. Uh, leave us your opinions on what you think of the Pound for Pound Box Report podcast and what improvements we can make. Um, and lastly, we got a link to where you can donate your account. Again, be a friend, be a pal, be a bunny, donate your Twitter account. The link for that is donateyouraccount.com forward slash P4P Box Report. And we'll repeat that, donateyouraccount.com forward slash P4P Box Report. And what happens when you donate your Twitter account, any tweet that comes from the Pound for Pound Box Report Twitter page, and the Twitter handle is at P4P Box Report. Any tweet that comes from the Pound for Pound Box Report Twitter page, um, your Twitter account will re retweet any tweet that comes from the Pound for Pound Box Report Twitter page. With all those issues out the way, let's get the show started. Mr. Attic, um, doing a recap of what went down this past week. Um, of course, the big fight this past week uh, was the showdown, the light heavyweight unification bout that took place Saturday, this past Saturday in Atlantic City, between uh, WBA IBF champion Bernard, the alien Hopkins now. And Sergey going to crush a couple level who had the WBO strap. Um, we talked about this uh, fight last week. You know, with our guest, you and I, uh, we pick Hopkins to win. Um, our guest, uh, Dudu Brown, Sean Newton, uh, pick uh, Kovalev to win. Um, I should say we also had uh, TJ, who was on the show last week. He also picked Hopkins to win by stoppage. I guess uh, TJ. Uh, you and I, we were all wrong. We were left with eggs on our face as uh, Kovalev uh, not just beat Hopkins, uh, but dominated Hopkins throughout. Um, scores of 120-107 on two scorecards, 120-106 on, th on the third scorecard. Kovalev got the firework started early, landing a counter right hand that put uh, Hopkins down. And I want your opinion on this, Mr. Boxing Addict. To me, at that point, everything seemed to change. Um, Hopkins began was fought very defensively. Um, the thing that impressed me in terms of Kovalev's performance uh, was the fact that he boxed Hopkins. Um, he did an excellent job of using his range. Um, the counter right hand particularly was effective all night long. Anytime Hopkins tried to move forward, Kovalev would pop him to the, on top of the head with the right hand, the counter right hand. The left jab to the, vibe, to the body was good. I think it, he used that as a range finder. Um, he uses great footwork to cut off the ring with Hopkins. And am I wrong in suggesting that at a certain point, um, I'm guessing around to me around around seven, eight, and nine, um, it was it almost seemed as if Bernard Hopkins was just fighting to go the distance. Um, he landed a couple of shots here and there, 
uh, to his credit, uh, Hopkins took a beating in round 12, but showed tremendous heart, tremendous, showed a terrific chin in surviving. Uh, your impressions on um, Sergey Kovalev's uh, dominant performance over the alien Bernard Hopkins? Yeah, well, I think we all got it wrong to a degree because I think we all thought that Kovalev would either stop him early and overpower him or uh, Hopkins would, you know, sneak a decision. But as it turns out, Kovalev did completely outthink him, outbox him. Um, there's a couple of theories going around. I mean, was this the fight that Hopkins did get old in the ring? He found that the guy was bigger, stronger, faster than he thought, and he couldn't do anything with him. I think it's probably the case, actually. Um, but I also think it's the case that Kovalev is the real deal, and he went in there with a great great game plan. He used his reach, stayed out of range. He never jumped in, um, which he could have done a lot of times when he had him cornered. It was very clever just to stay out of distance in case Hopkins come, came back with something. Um, and he, he he was really patient throughout, um, and that was the key, really. But by the end, um, you know, you could see that Kovalev probably could have started letting go a little bit earlier and stopped him. But by the 12th round, he, he took a, quite a beating, actually, Hopkins, and I'd be surprised if we see him again. Um, it was reported in boxing scene, actually, that Hopkins said that he, he will fight again and he could possibly move down. Uh, mm -hmm. to 168. Uh, before talking about that potential fight, before that um, news, and as well as the future of Kovalev, I want to go back to uh, Hopkins right quick and then have an analysis about Kovalev. Um, whether Hopkins should fight on, whether he decides to eventually retire. Um, no thoughts about Bernard Hopkins. Bernard Hopkins, the fighter, uh, and Bernard Hopkins, the person, I mean, what he's done in the ring um, has really been historic of uh, what, what he did at middleweight, um, moving up at such a late age um, to 175 pounds doing what he did. Um, and even the fact that he survived that last round, like I said, with Kovalev, um, a lot of folks wouldn't survive that round. And outside the ring, um, the way he's conducted, sure, he has said some controversial things, but uh, the way he's been an ambassador for the sport, uh, the way he stood up for fighters, uh, spoken out against the sanctioning bodies and organizations and promoters, his ongoing fight with certain promoters, even if it has had a um, detriment to his career, particularly early on. Um, speak about uh, Bernard Hopkins, uh, the fighter, and Bernard Hopkins, the person. Well, as a fighter, you know, we, we know the story. He, he lost his first fight, didn't he? Um, yes. And, you know, he then sort of went out of the ring, I think, for a year or more and got himself together and, you know, he came from the streets and all of that sort of thing. Um, obviously a very hard man, he's had it hard in his life. But, you know, he came through to be this middleweight champion with so many defences and just, just with a style that, well, a style that's changed over the years, mainly through age. But, you know... <sighs> Just a, an, an incredible guy, really, in the ring and out the ring. I'm a big fan of him out the ring, actually. I think we need more people like him. He's a bit of a revolutionary, which I quite like. Um, you know, he won't always go with the grain, and he's always he's always there for a good comment. And, you know, whether it's to stir things up a little bit, I don't know. But you can't argue with his record. You can't argue with what he's done. I mean... There hasn't been anybody like him in boxing at the age of 49, especially in this, this day and age, um, where you need to be at the top of your game to be at the top. And no, he, he's a one-off, really. I'll be sad to see him, see him leave the game, but I do think it's time he retires now. Um, it's okay saying go down to 168, but who are you going to fight at 168? Uh, he's already said before that he won't fight Ward. Um, and Ward's the best in the division. So if he doesn't fight him, what's he really going down there for? Um, I don't think he's got anything left to prove. I think if he got in there with, I don't know, Frotch, for instance, I think Frotch would 
beat him as well, probably in a similar fashion to Kovalev, maybe not as destructively, but I think he'd outpoint him or he'd stop him. Um, but yeah, just a, an amazing guy, really. He'll be he'll be sad when he hangs the gloves up. But you know, it, he hung in there against Kovalev when many wouldn't. I mean, when you think about Nathan Cleverly or you know younger world champions who've been in with Kovalev, who got blown out within two or three rounds. Um, it just showed how tough Hopkins is. I mean, he got caught with some flush shots there. But he, he stayed on his feet at times. I don't know how he did, but I think he wanted to prove a point in the end, and I think you're right. By sort of eight or nine rounds, he knew he's either got to land a massive shot or he's got to survive, and, you know, he, he, he survived. But, yeah, amazing guy. Can't, you know... Can't say enough about him, really. And, and let's talk about um, Sergei Kovalev, uh, the evolution um, of a fighter. Um, he showed that he's more than a one-trick pony uh, Saturday night. Um, we knew about the power. We knew about the size. Um, but it was the intelligence um, that he displayed, uh, the cool, the patience that he showed um, against Hopkins. Because a lot of fighters with his relative experience vis-a-vis -vis number of fights um, would have tried to go in there, um, make more um, than was there. Um, he took opportunities when he was there and when he wasn't there, he was ready to, he was, when the opportunities was not there for him to land big shots, he just stayed patient, used the jab, um, landed his shots here and there, make sure he scored the points, enough points uh, to win the fight. Uh, Kovalev, your thoughts on him and your thoughts on his future. I mean, there's opportunities out there. Of course, there's Stevenson at 175. Um, there's fighters at 168. Um, maybe a Ward, uh, maybe a Frotch, uh, maybe um, uh, a Stieglitz, Abraham, Comp Sturm combination, whoever comes out of that trio, they're all fighting each other. Um, your thoughts on um, Sergey Kovalev and what he showed as a fighter and in in also his future. Yeah, I think he, I think he's shown he's the best light heavyweight in the world, and I think he's shown that doing that to Hopkins, which really nobody's done before. You can say it's age or whatever, but you know whatever, nobody's done that. And I think if you put Ward in there with him, I think Kovalev beats Ward because he's shown that he can box, he can stay away, he can stay out of range, and he can land his power shots. Now, Ward, for instance, he's a master of... And, and excuse me, Attic, I also forgot to mention um, the young guy, uh, not young guy, but young guys in terms of limited experience, um, Bertibiev, who uh, destroyed uh, Tavares Cloud, I believe it was, a few months, a uh, month or so ago. Yeah, I've not I've not seen seen enough as of well him. as as well as Pascal. I should throw him in there as well. Yeah, um, I think Pascal is coming to the end end for myself. He didn't look great against Butte. Um, I don't really rate him up there anymore. He's still it's still a good fighter, but the fact that he got beat by Hopkins twice, in my opinion. Um, means that he's not he's not up there, and I don't think he could live with Kovalev um, for twelve rounds. He might do well for six or seven, but I think eventually Kovalev would get to him. Um, yeah, Berbatov, or, or I'm not sure his exact name. I'm, I haven't seen enough of him, so I can't really comment on him. But for me, Kovalev's the best light heavyweight out there. I think he beats Stevenson. I think he beats him quite easily, actually. I think he hunts him down and does him within four or five rounds. Um, obviously, Stevenson's got that big shot that if he lands is very dangerous, but if he boxes effectively like he did against Hopkins, I don't see anybody beating Kovalev at the moment. I really don't. I think that's how impressive that, that last fight was for him. He'd proved before what a great, you know, what great power he'd had and everything else, and People may be umdenard about the quality of opponents he'd, he'd fought, but it really was just such a huge win for him because it showed that he can box and punch. Um, so 
for me, I don't see anybody out there capable of beating Kovalev at the moment. I really don't, and that includes Ward at one six eight. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of Stevenson, uh, before we move on, in terms of the uh, potential fight with Stevenson, look, Stevenson will present him some different. Um, uh, he would provide. He would give um, Kovalev something different to see because of the southpaw style, um, yeah. because of the long arms that he has, and because he can punch as well. But eventually, when you look at Stevenson, uh, to me, he's a bit one-dimensional. You can kind of see what he's going to do. He's, a lot of his stuff is predicated off the left hand. It's either a jab left hand or a double jab left hand, um, and not much else. He doesn't have much of a right hook as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah. It's not that good. It's not that short. And it can be countered. Um, from far approved that. Um, while he will provide Stevenson with some something different-wise, he, he, he has pretty good hand speed as well, but I think in... I think Kofi Blair will eventually wear Adana Stevenson down and, and, and uh, take him out late. So I agree with you on that one. Uh, let's move forward. Uh, talk about the fight on the undercard of Kofi Blair Hopkins. Um, Saddam Ali, uh, a guy with an undefeated record coming in, but didn't have that much oppos uh, didn't have that great opposition. Hadn't really fought up that many fighters of known quality of name quality. Uh, Scored an upset round, upset ninth round TKO stoppage over Carlos Abregu. Um, I thought that Ali could beat Abregu because I didn't think Abregu was that much of a boxer. I think I thought he was limited, um, even though he had one loss and that one loss made to Timothy Bradley. When I saw him fight, I thought he could be out box. I didn't think he could be knocked out though. Um, I know the fans booed um, in, sp in spots throughout the fight. But I was impressed with Ali and, and the patience that he had, um, the cool that he had, just like with Kovalev. Um, there were a couple of times where he got uh, buzzed a little bit by the power of Abregu, but um, he showed surprising power here. Um, your thoughts on this uh, upset win by uh, Ali over Abregu? Well, uh, I must say, I'm a massive fan of this Ali. Um, after watching that fight, I think he's absolutely brilliant. I loved it. Um, I think he's got great movement, he's fast, he throws punches from all angles, um, he totally out outboxed Abregu, which, you know, we thought he, he may, but we thought Abregu would probably get to him eventually, um, but he showed he had power, um, skill, I, I really, really like this guy, um, it really annoys me when fans start booing in the crowd, you know, um, it's something I, I really hate. Um, I don't know if it was because they were waiting so long in between fights. That seemed to be what the commentators on Box Nation that I was watching the fight on uh, seemed to say. They said there was a lot of uh, a big delay between the fights, and by the time that fight came round, Ali was using his skill and movement and dancing around, and they wanted to see some action, so they started booing. But I really don't. You know, it, it annoys me so much when I hear that. But anyway, um, it looked at one stage that Ali had uh, he'd knocked him down. He looked really good. But then Abregu came back at him, and we thought, okay, Ali looks like he may be folding here. But he stuck through it, and I don't know if he was conserving energy or what. It looked that that way to me. I think he conserved his energy, and then started throwing throwing his shots again and uh, and took him out and I love the guy and he's he's, uh, he's of Yemeni descent as well isn't he he's, uh, he's from Nazim Hamed country and I think he's got a little bit of that flair in him as well he seems very humble with it which isn't like Hamed but um, I think he could go all the way this guy you know he's only 26 years old um, you know, he's unbeaten. Okay, the standard of people he's faced so far haven't been great, but Abregu is a good win because he's a solid fighter at that weight. Um, and could he beat some of the top guys? I don't know. He needs to be tested um, stamina-wise and with a chin against a top fighter, doesn't he? But, you know, he proved that he's certainly got the skills to, to go all the way. I, I love I, I, I think he's, he's cracking. I'd watch him again. Yeah, I mean, I do, Ali put him down, put Abregu down, I believe in round six. Um, heard him later on in that round. 
Um, and that point on, he took total control. Um, had him in trouble again in round seven and eight, and finally finished him off in the ninth round. Um, in terms of the future of Ali, I agree with you. Well, I'm not going to say he's ready for the elite at welterweight yet. Um, I still think he needs some seasoning. Um, I think he still needs to fight some guys uh, who can test him, uh, not in terms of his chin necessarily, not just that, but in terms of his ability to uh, box. Um, I want to see him in there with a guy who's um, at his level in terms of boxing skill because that's how he's been beating guys by outboxing him. And yeah. if, 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 if he's going to compete with the, uh, the Thurmans, uh, the Kell Brooks, uh, the Bradleys, uh, the Amir Khans of the world, um, I would like to see him in, in, in against a guy who can make him step it up a level in terms of his boxing ability. Because he's going to need that in order to uh, have a chance against the guys I just mentioned. Yeah, I think um, I think sometimes though we can get a little bit sort of think about it too much in that you know he hasn't been in with the best yet, and he needs some of those fights. But to throw him in there with one of these guys, he might end up doing what he did to Abregu. I know Abregu's a little less limited, but his skills are that good. I think he can hit and hurt anybody. And, you know, it, it, we proved it with Kel Brook, who took a lot, a lot of stick for having 30 odd fights against you know, nobody really of note, and then went in there and, and, and beat Porter. So, I don't know. Uh, to me, he looks like he's got the skill. But, yeah, it's going to take, you know, they're not going to throw him right, right in at the deep end. But,. Let's let's see how he progresses, but I'm going to keep an eye on him because he, he looks he looks brilliant to me. I really enjoyed watching him. And, and see, that's the thing. Um, you mentioned Kell Brook. See, I think Kell Brook is just as much of a, bo be a, a boxer, if not a better uh, boxer, if not more skilled than um, Saddam Ali at this point. And he's going to need something more than that uh, to beat a Kell Brook. Um, mm. Thurman, he may have he may be more skilled slightly. But he's still he's going to need something more to uh, go in there and to beat a Keith Thurman. Uh, same thing with Amir, well, Amir Khan. If he can not get hit, because we all know Khan's chinny, um, he's going to need something more than boxing. Um, he going to be he's going to have to box at a higher level to beat those guys. Yeah. Well, yeah. Let's let's see once he's in with the boxer. Um, I agree, yeah, I agree with what you're saying. Um, Let's see how he fares against somebody who's got who's got decent skill. Um, but yeah, he's, he's worth keeping an eye on. It was certainly a fight that surprised a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. Let's move on to a uh, fight that took place uh, earlier Saturday in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Um, I don't know if you saw this fight. Um, Amir Mansour, uh, not too long ago, lost to uh, Brian Jennings. Um, uh, came back into the ring, uh, fought a guy by the name of Kasi. Um, actually, it was a very good fight on NBC uh, Sportsnet. Um, the last fight, uh, by the way, um, on the series that run by the Duvas. Uh, for those who don't know, NBC Sports Sportsnet, they made a deal with Al Hammond. He will be taking over that uh, next year. Um, Mansoor, for those who don't know, he's outside the ring life. Uh, Sir had a stint in prison for drug charges. Uh, like I said, he was coming up. He wasn't coming off the loss against Brian James. I'm sorry. He's coming off the loss to Steve Cunningham of this past April. Yeah. Um, Kasi, he hurt, as far as I'm concerned, Mansoor a couple of times um, through the fight. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you look at uh, Mansoor, um, he eventually overpowered um, Kasi. Uh, the left hand to the head uh, by Mansoor. That was one of the knockouts of the year, really annihilating him. Your thoughts on that bout? Yeah, and well, unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't see the bout, but um, I have seen Mansoor before against Cunningham. Uh, yeah, it, it looks like um, you know he did a decent job. I mean, you can tell me more about it, but you know, I like Mansoor as a fighter. I think he's got a very, uh, very good style. Um, is he, is he sort of? Top echelon, I don't know. Um, we need to see him in there with some decent guys now, don't we? And see uh, at this age, at this age, what he's really got. 
I mean, at the age of 42, has he got much left? All right, he's a brawler. He doesn't have much boxing skills. He's an older cat, you know. But the dude got a lot of heart. He's gritty. He's grimy. I love him. Uh, before you, before, before, let me introduce you formally. Uh, D joined us um, right now. Um, D, a.k.a. Doodle Brown. How you doing, D? How you doing, baby? Uh, continue on your comments about uh, Mansoor and the win. The yeah, he's, he's a gritty guy, man. I mean, he comes in there to do one thing, and that's to annihilate his opponent. <laughs> he wants to get him out of there as fast as possible. He ain't trying to do no twelve rounds. Now we see him do twelve rounds. Of course, have to take have to take his you know his, his empty. So you know when he gets up, if he ever gets up up there where he's fighting elite fighters and stuff like that, uh, he's gonna need to be working on his conditioning and uh, stop being one dimensional. You know, learn to box. Because uh, that greedy stuff and going in for the, you know, bomb trying to bomb up, that's not going to work with everybody. I'm telling you, I mean, I like the guy, but that's not going to work with everybody. He's doing it now, but it's not going to last that long. Um, I want to go back and see you on this one, D. Uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity to brag right now. Uh, oh, I, I talk, about, I talk about COVID-11 Hopkins since uh, last week. You were the one. Who said that Kovalev will win and win quite easily? Uh, your assessment of Kovalev's win over Bernard Hopkins last Saturday? They did, like I said, they did a great study, a team study. Bernard, very good. You know, they implemented what they wanted to do. They, they, they didn't let allow Bernard to do what he wanted to do. You know what I'm saying? He couldn't step in and go inside, pull him, and yank him around. You know, smother his punches, hit him and all that. He couldn't do nothing. They shut that down. When, when they shut that down, I saw fear in Bernard Hopkins' eyes. I literally saw the man scared to death in that ring for a minute. It wasn't the whole fight. It took a minute. But yeah. when he got kind of scared, he was scared to death there. You think he was running shit in his man. It was crazy. I was like, oh, my God, I hope he don't kill him. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, a, it was a good fight, man. It was a 50-year-old guy, man. I know he's a legend, but he still you gotta understand the guy is still an old guy. He got old bones, old legs. You understand what I'm saying? His hands the punch don't go nowhere. You punch you there, you punch it, you die. Your fists and all that stuff. But his legs and stuff, he, he looked like an old dude. He looked like an old dude. It showed up. It finally showed up. Yeah. We talked about that earlier, didn't we, Michael? I think he did get old in the ring that night. Oh yeah, oh yeah. He knew he didn't know what he would get up to. He thought he was going to fight another cat like uh, Kelly Pavic. I don't mm. know if I'm saying his name right. He thought he was going to fight another flat-footed, stand in front of his face, you know, don't move, don't go nowhere, and, and you can pre predict his punches, his moves and all that. He couldn't do that with uh, old boy. I told y'all he was going to box. And people was like, oh, he's not going to box. He don't, a couple of us don't know how to box. I said, I've seen it. The man can box. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He just don't go in for the kill right away like a Mirasu or something like that. You know what I mean? He took his time. He's patient. He knew what he was doing. I tried, you know, Bernard didn't get knocked out. That's all. I was just bugging out. like, wow, this man stood. Remember how close he was to the mat when he when him that one time with that right? I was yeah. like, oh, there you go. That motherfucker stood right up. <laughs> uh, it, it, showed, it, showed, it. it showed how tough Hopkins yeah, really man. is, though. Yeah, it's a, it's a testament to how tough he is. Yeah, uh, man. I, I, will, I, will ask, I will ask you a question. I'll ask... Uh, Boxing Attic, um, earlier before you joined on, um, we're looking at Kovalev's future. Um, of course, there's the fight out there with Stevenson that folks want. Um, you also got yeah. 168 with the, would be like some Ward or Frotch or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, Triple. I don't think that fight will happen, but um, there's Darrell. I, I forgot to mention him. Um, the Darrell brothers. Um, you got Pascal at 175. Uh, you got the Russian guy who destroyed um, um, Tavares Cloud, Berta Biev. Um, many options for Sergey Kovalev uh, moving forward at 168 and 175 pounds. Uh, where do you think he will go, D? I mean, if he doesn't fight um, uh, Adana Stevenson, I'm still, I'm still up in the air whether that fight will happen. But Stevenson is the obvious fight. Should that fight not happen, where do you think he'll go? I think he'll just fight somebody, a no-name, so a filler. You know, he just had a, to him, a mentally tough fight with Bernard Hopkins. So I don't see them jumping in 
no time soon with anybody elite right now that's really, really elite. So uh, you probably have somebody we ain't even heard of your fight next. Watch. I'm telling you, it happens all the time. What I mean by that, what I mean, what I really mean is, what I really mean, excuse me, what do you think his next big fight will come from? Oh, big, big fight, yeah, that would be Donna Stevens, man. For sure. That'd be undisputed, right? It's got to be. It's got yeah, to be a Donna Stevens. You've got to see that fight. I mean, yeah. I, I believe the right price, Adonis would take that fight. He said it once before. He said, what, well, well, last year, he said when everybody was talking about them fights. He said, if they come up with the money is right, I'll fight them. I don't think the money was right. Then they switched over to another, you know, cable. I think when they switched to Showtime or something. Yeah. yeah. Donna Stevens, that would be his next defining fight. That would be a, that'd be his defining fight. For real. Young guy, strong, just like him. He ain't no old cat, you know, come up, blow the middleweight, you know, nothing like that. Yeah. The, other, yeah, the other thing is that Stevenson is he's 37 now, isn't he? So 38 next year is he? Um, that fight needs to happen next year. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to see that fight. That's some that pay per view right there. Yeah. At the very least, they uh, main event another main event uh, HBO Showtime. And I don't know if it's pay per view ready yet. Um, give us some time, but uh, it's a big buy for sure. It's certainly the best buy. I would love to see personally. Kovalev fight Andre Ward because I, the best light heavyweight, the best super middleweight in the world. Um, of course, Ward got to get his situation. He actually got to get in the ring. Ward is getting on my nerves a little bit, being so out of the ring so much. But personally, yeah. even more than hurt, Kovalev and Stevenson, I would love to see Kovalev fight Andre Ward. Yeah. Well, uh, Ward is really smart. He's really good. Yeah. Ward would, be, Ward would be the favorite, no doubt, but it would be interesting to see how would he deal with something that, with all that Kovalev's brings, because he hasn't been in the ring with a guy I, with that combination of power and size. I'd be worried about Ward's safety in that fight. Yeah, man, one punch probably would kill him, too. He didn't fight a, a light headway. Leave, leave Ward alone. <laughs> 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 and he, he's been inactive for so long, you know what I mean? I thought he said he's probably in the gym working out and all that stuff, but still, dang, yeah. I miss him. You know, Ward Ward manages to, you know, like the Frotch fight, he managed to outclass him and sort of stay safe. But against a bigger guy like Kovalev, who is, you know, he's just a beast in there, but a beast with boxing skill. So okay. you get hit by that guy, you're in trouble. And, you know, Hopkins... Managed to just last it out, but I don't think Ward would have took those shots, to be honest. I don't either. I know he would. I don't think no man on this earth would have took them shots. The alien got the alien head. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I don't think. I don't think. I don't, we don't know about man. I don't he, think Ward would get killed. Right. I don't think, you know, he took think. a shot and he looked like he was going to get killed in there, didn't he? He looked. Uh, well, I started praying. I started praying, dog. I'm not playing. I was like, oh my god, he gonna kill him. But I don't, I don't think Ward would get hit with those kind of shots either. See, that's true, the thing. True, true, true. It would be intriguing. It definitely be intriguing because you know, at, what we've noticed now, uh, we've seen uh, Kovalev fight against Cedric Agnew. He got hit. He pushed him back. He's hittable. He got hit with Bernard. It looked like Bernard hurt him a couple times when he was kind of uh, the tank was running low. You know, so the guy is a human. He he, he can be hurt. And plus Ward. And plus Ward is younger. And he can be rough, if not borderline dirty at times. And yeah, that, when has Kovalev ever faced right. the guy and that would give him that kind of, you know? That's true. Yeah, that's true. Let's move on. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ad. Ward would be probably. I, I see him as the only person out there who could possibly beat him, but I still don't think him. Think he beat him. I think Kovalev beats everyone. I don't know about everyone now, y'all. Don't get it twisted. Like I said, the man is—he can be hit. I mean, he's not that—he's not elusive. He's right there. I mean, he stepped back. He stepped back is like he's stepping back a whole what 500 feet because his legs are so damn long. But yeah. young cat, good legs, fresh legs, can right get past that long reach. It might—you never know. Yeah, let's move on and, and talk about this final fight before we get into the news. Um, fight that took place over in um, Germany. As uh, Robert Stieglitz, former uh, WBO champion at 168 pounds, 
fought uh, multiple time uh, middleweight champion uh, Felix Sturm. Uh, fight took place in Stuttgart, and I go see. I don't think you saw it, D. So I'll go to you on this one, Alec. I think you saw the fight. Uh, they both fought, like I said, in Stuttgart, Germany. Fight ended in a draw. Um, early on, um, Sturm was controlling the pace, controlling the fight. Uh, but as this rounds went on, second half of the fight, I think it's the size of Stiglitz, uh, the strength of Stiglitz uh, took over um, back and forth on social media in terms of who won. Some had uh, Sturm winning, some had Stiglitz winning. I wasn't ups I wasn't upset at the draw at all. Um, your thoughts on about and your thoughts on a potential rematch because I think a rematch is originally going to happen. Yeah, it was good. it was a good fight actually. Uh, I personally had. Stieglitz coming through and winning it, um, but you know, good fight. One I'd like to see again because um, it does deserve a rematch. Sometimes these fights in Germany, you know, with the scorecards, they can be dodgy as hell. You think, oh, a draw, okay, that's happened again. But this time, a draw was probably a fair result. Um, Sturm still has it in the tank. There was question marks over Sturm whether he still had it. He's getting on in age, etc. But, you know, he looked good. And the same, there was question marks with Stieglitz after his loss to Abraham. So they both came out of it looking okay, actually. Yeah, um, Abraham, by the way, who was at ringside, it was anticipated that the winner of this fight uh, fight Arthur Abraham. Well, they say that, but apparently Abraham versus Smith on February the 22nd is just about a done, done deal for their rematch. So, oh, so he's going to fight the rematch with Paul Smith. Yeah, apparently that's uh, being talked about now. They're just trying to sort the date out with German and British TV. Oh, cool, cool. Uh, yeah. Let's move on. Um, I, I know we're going to get into some boxing nerdery here. So, And I know you don't follow these fighters, D, so you may want to sit down for a second here. Um, I think you know this fighter I'm talking about. Uh, if you've been a listener to the Pound for Pound Boxing Report YouTube show and podcast um, over the past six months or so to a year, um, I've talked a lot about uh, a guy I consider a young phenom in the lightweight division, a Japanese fighter by the name of Naoi Anui. Uh, in March, I believe it was, March or May, one of those months, he uh, won the Junior Flyweight Championship, WBC version, uh, made one defense. Uh, I think, personally, Anui is one of the more talented fighters in the world. Um, Pound for pound, he's not the best because he's so young, but um, he, cause he's a guy who can do it all. Well, news broke uh, last week, I held on to it, I wanted to talk about it tonight, that Anui, um, has this 21-year-old Anui, has decided to uh, relinquish his belt at 108 pounds, uh, skipping the flyweight division, moving up to 115 pounds to fight um, long-reigning champion Omar Navias, uh, December 30th, I believe, either the 30th or the 31st. Those who don't know, who remember on um, Navias, he was the guy who went up to fought Nonia Tonair and kind of actually uh, laid an egg against Donaire, did nothing for 12 rounds as, easy, as Donaire coasted to an easy win. Um, look, I'll go to you on this one, Attic. Uh, we know about Anui. We know how talented he is. Uh, we know how good he is at such a young age. I mean, he's had less than 10 fights, but he's as far as I'm concerned, was already the best at 108 pounds. He decided to move up to 115. Navarro is old, but he's still good, um, even though he struggled his last couple of fights. Uh, do you think that Anui is biting up more than he can chew, or is this the perfect opportunity to move up uh, to face a guy like Navarro? Because as good as Anui was, even though I thought he was the best at 108 pounds, He's young, he's long, he's tall, so he was struggling to make weight. Your thoughts on this move? Yeah, I, I think I think he might be biting off a bit too much there, to be honest. I mean, I know Navarez is old, and you know we're looking at, at him maybe retiring in a year or two, but I think he still has enough, and I think he's still you know at the bigger weight. I think he's got to be too too strong for him, to be honest. I think. He'd probably win a points decision. Very interesting fight. I hope and knew he can do it, actually. I'd like to see him do it. Uh, the all-star, and he's, he's supremely skilled. 
And the interesting move for me is is that he's skipping 112 pounds. Uh, for those who don't know, I've talked about the flyweight division before. I think it's one of the best in boxing. You got Roman Gonzalez who just moved up, uh, beat Akira Yagashi for his belt. Uh, you got Estrada who fought Roman Gonzalez in 2012 and won the fights of the year. You got I'm not Renroy, a very good fighter out of Thailand. Uh, you got Zusha Meng, who's also campaigning um, at 112 pounds as well. Uh, Brian Valorio, he's still around at 112. So it's interesting that um, Anoy is skipping that division and moving up to 115. I'm thinking that he feels should he beat no, who, who should he beat Novaez is that he's going to make his mark at 115 pounds. There's not much there. As far as I'm concerned, at 115, outside of the uh, WBC champion uh, Quadras, who I believe is fighting, um, maybe fighting tonight. I have to look it up and see. He's going to be defining his belt soon, and maybe tonight, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, actually, he is fighting later on tonight in, in Washington, D.C. He's going to be defending his belt. But oh. be that as it may, um, I'm thinking that uh, Navarez is folks thinking that. Because he's struggling in the main weight, uh, they feel that moving to 115 pounds will be an easy jump for him. I think they feel that um, Navias is really, really long in the tooth that he's ready to be beaten. Uh, he can make his move at 115 and wait for the, the Gonzalez and the Estradas and whatnot to possibly move up. Um, am I wrong here in my assessment? No, I don't think so. I mean... <laughs> I think he, you know, skipping skipping the division is probably the way forward for him. Um, Navarez, it's a tricky one to. I I think he'll still be very very tough to face. I mean, what do you reckon? It's going to be it's going to be tough, but I think that um, Nui is just just so damn talented. Yeah. If you haven't seen him, uh, just check him out on YouTube. Um, and his fights on YouTube. This guy is. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> he's not Mayweather. He's he's not at the level of Mayweather, not yet, or Riggy and Leo, who I just think are the most skilled fighters in the world, most talented fighters in the world, as well as Andre Ward. But he's not that far off. Right. I mean, the way he destroyed um, Hernandez and even his first child defense, um, he had his way with this. Um, I forgot the guy's name from Thailand. He had his way with him. He could do anything he wanted. He made it. He makes it look easy. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's supremely skilled, there's no doubt. I mean, and I, I'd love him to beat him actually, and uh, you know, because he could be a real little superstar. I don't think the, you know, the lower weights get as much attention, do they? But there's some great fights down at those weights. I mean, they're so fast, those guys, aren't they? It's, it's amazing. You know, they normally get some really good scraps. Oh, I love it. I love it. Look, they get more bang. Look, they don't get the coverage. They don't make the money, of course. But you get more bang for your buck, and you get more action. Uh, from those guys and quiet as kept. We're gonna really be honest here. Quiet as kept. They develop faster and they're more skilled than even the the, the middleweights, the light heavyweights, and certainly the heavyweights. So um, I love it. Yeah. Well, they call him the they call him the little monster, don't they? Let's see uh, if he is at that weight. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, let's move on. It's gonna be a short show. Um, we're going to do a fight preview, get to our preview segments, and we're going to uh, close the show down uh, this evening. Um, I'm going to bring you back into the picture, D. Um, big fight this weekend, of course, is uh, the heavyweight champion of the world, uh, Vladimir Klitschko fighting Kabra Kulev, Pulev, excuse me, in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, the bout's going to be shown live on HBO. Um, Klitschko is the best in the world. Do you see Pulev, D, um, giving Klitschko any any de any kind of a fight here? Yeah, I'll put up a fight at first. For the first four rounds, they do. And then they get happy and get comfortable. And he starts pulling them in and grabbing them and hanging on their back. And by the seventh, eighth round, if they still there, yeah, I don't see the guy doing nothing. No, no different than the other guy. I think he's inexperienced. And he ain't. he's not used to somebody. I'm pretty sure somebody hugging and holding them and hanging on their back. You know how he do. <laughs> That's what he's gonna do. Uh, your thoughts on about uh, boxing at it? Yeah, I don't think uh, I don't see Pulev doing anything against M Klitschko. To be honest, I think Klitschko will jab his head off to the point where he can't take any more. 
<laughs> it'll take him out yeah. like he does to yeah. most people. But you know, I'm just I'm just praying that Klitschko hangs up his gloves next year. You know, because I want the heavyweight division to to reignite, and it can now because you've got people coming through. Um, you know, Joshua's going to be an uh, an immense star at that weight. Um, so I want him out of the game, and I want to see Stavrum and Fury and all these guys going at it to win titles, and it will reignite again. Especially if we get a good American heavyweight come through the. Yeah, and you, you got Deontay Wilder as well, who's supposed yeah, to fight. Sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah, Wilder. Yeah, of course, Wilder's well in the mix, and he's going to be fighting uh, Fury apparently after Fury Chisora providing Fury wins. Um, well, Wild is actually facing Stavrum, isn't he? But yeah. there's, a, there's a mix there. So whoever comes out of those fights with victories, we're going to see a nice little round robin of, of fights with decent guys. It's going to be exciting, I think. So hopefully Klitschko can just retire and get out of the way because he's done everything. He's beat everyone. Everyone's just a bit bored now, aren't they? Yeah, he ain't going nowhere, though. Yeah, I was going to ask uh, you a question, um, Attic, before I move on to D, because... Um, cool. We're gonna have a little discussion about the heavyweight division right now. Um, you mentioned Anthony Joshua. Um, you over there in, in, in England. Um, what is the vibe over there for Anthony Joshua? Uh, are they looking at him to be a, a mage, not just in the ring, but in terms of the out of the ring superstar? Is he going to surpass in terms of popularity of not just a Lennox Lewis, but a Frank Bruno? Um, yeah. The potential in and out of the ring for um, Anthony Josh because I like him as a fighter. I think he's very talented. I think he has I a lot of talent, a lot of skill. And I think he could be a potential champion. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't just think he'll be a potential champion. I think he'll be a unified champion for many years. I think he's that good. Oh, wow. Um, he, he is, he's got everything, inside and outside the ring. I've been lucky enough to meet him a few times, and he's just such a lovely, humble guy. The British public always all, already love him because he's won a, a gold medal in London in the Olympics. So he's already well known throughout Britain. Um, he's a good-looking guy, you know. The girls love him. The guys love him. He's got skills. He's he's hugely powerful. I mean, the physique on the guy is incredible. Um, but he's got the skill to go with it. He's like a, he's like a Kovalev of the heavyweight division. He is an absolute beast. And he, I don't see anybody beating him out there for the next five years unless somebody comes through the ranks. I mean, he's going to fight Michael Sprott next week, who's, you know, he's an average guy who Klitschko beat four or five fights ago. But it's only his ninth or tenth fight. But by the end of next year, he'll be in there with the likes of Fury, Chisora, whoever. And they're building him and building him and building him to a point where he'll be fighting in front of 80,000 at Wembley. In big heavyweight fights, and oh, he'll be wow. he'll be destroying people. Honestly, he'll be the biggest sports star Britain's had for God knows how long since since long David since David Beckham, you know. And he's going to be a worldwide wide sports star. He'll be as good as Lennox Lewis. I'm not I'm not over egging the pudding here. He, this guy is going to be the bollocks. I'm about to watch one of his fights. I can't yeah. really watch one of his fights. Go and see Anthony Joshua. Yeah, it's your, it's Olympic gold. Um, yeah, I, no, I've heard about him, but I haven't really watched any of his fights. He's not in the States yet. Okay, D, I'll go yeah. to you uh, right now. Uh, yeah, his fights are all over YouTube. You can find every one of his professional fights on YouTube as well as the all Olympic right. fights. But I want to go back to back, uh, have a quick discussion about the heavyweight division. Um, added, he mentioned uh, Anthony Joshua. Uh, you got Deontay Wilder, you got Stavern, you got Brian Jennings, um, you got Fury. Um, the future of the heavyweight division, uh, considering those fighters, what do you see of it? Uh, and, and of all those fighters who I mentioned, who do you think will eventually uh, be the top dog, that top guy? Out of all those guys, hmm. well, if, if Mavern fights Deontay Wilder, he's waiting for him to sign the contract, right? I, in my heart of heart, I believe that Deontay Wilder, I've said this plenty of times before, I ain't got nothing against the man. I like him. He's funny. He's cool. I just don't think he has a chance. I think Remain would tap that chance. He's out of there. I don't think Brian Bye could beat Deontay Wilder or Amir or 
uh, remain. You know, <laughs> it's, just, it's gonna be like one in the eighties when all the, the, the uh, black heavyweights were fighting each other and knocking each other off and fighting each other again. You know, that's what I, that's what I see. And then it's gonna be then they'll have to get to Klitschko, and you already know what's gonna happen because that man is not retired no time soon. He wants to unify all the belts. He wants to remain the belt. So that's his goal. He's not going nowhere. What you think about Tyson Fury? Who I don't I don't think he's the best, but he certainly got the sure. biggest man. Crazy! It's like, what's going on? Now I see the press conference between him and Derek Shore is back on. The fight is back on. He, I, I, I don't get it. If he beat Derek the first time, what is his problem? I think um, what it is is, I mean, I watched that first fight, and I only had Fury winning it maybe by a round, you know. Yeah, it was a close fight on my scorecard too. Yeah. I, mean, I wouldn't be surprised if Chisora beats him in a rematch. That's just me. Yeah, a lot of people that think. Would be fair though. Cause he acts so crazy and weird. I think some of that is, some of it. Yeah, he's a jerk. He's an ass. But I think a lot of it is some of it as well. Is his is an act. It is he himself up to get him more ratings and ultimately, which means more money. You know what? I I absolutely hated Fury for years. Uh, it, I, I couldn't stand him, um, and a lot of people feel like that. But I've seen a lot of interviews with him now, and. To be honest, and I've heard from a few guys within sort of boxing in England who who say he's he's such a nice guy. It's all an act to try and make himself money and you know get to the top of the game, and that's fair, that's fair enough. He brings some excitement and some fun to it when you. Yeah, think he does. It. I love watching him talk. I mean, if he cuts them out, he don't care. He cuts them yeah. out. <laughs> I think we need people like that in boxing, don't we? Whether you love yeah, them or hate. It's entertaining. Him. It's entertaining. But then, but then when the fight, they say he hurt his arm or something. Something happened. That that fight didn't happen, and then he was supposed to fight the other the other fighter. And then I think when he saw that guy, I kept saying that guy is gonna beat Tyson Fury. Now I knew the fight was off. He had hurt himself, so I don't know. I was like, Yeah, he's a, he recently wow. called out Anthony Joshua too. And okay, he could call him out now, but in a year from now, Joshua would knock him out. Yeah, you know right, what? Right. They want to experience. He's still green. Yeah. You know? like, Fury's yeah. being clever. He's being clever because he knows he needs to fight him right now because he's only had nine professional fights and he's still a little bit inexperienced. But he knows a year right. or two. Yeah. He, he's in trouble. And also, he sparred Joshua a few years ago. And he came out of that spar and said, Joshua is the next heavyweight champion of the world. Um... Klitschko said it as well when they sparred a few months ago with Joshua. He said, this guy is the real deal. He's the next heavyweight champion. So these guys are going to fight each other over the next year or so, and then Joshua's going to come in and clean up. That's the way I see it. I do isn't like there, Isn't there a video of the sparring session between Joshua and Klitschko on YouTube? Oh, right. I've not seen that, but, um, but yeah. He's okay, been over well. there sparring with Klitschko. He beat he beat he beat Fury up in sparring three years ago. Damn. Yeah. Well, I've been hearing a lot um, about Scott. So I just been really watching his fight. Yeah, go and have a look at him. All the ladies love him as well, Dudu, so you'll be alright. Yeah, he's a nice looking yeah, he's a nice looking guy. He's got big old arms. How tall is him? Like six, six, <laughs> six, seven. Yeah, um, he's, yeah, he's a big dude. Yeah, something like that. I think he's six five actually. I think that may be wrong, but Okay, okay. I stand but, yeah, for that thing. The physique on the I dude. I want to ask y'all a question. What do y'all think about Shannon Briggs? You know that's my buddy. What do y'all think about Shannon Briggs fighting Vladimir Klitschko? That's you an act. What? That's an act. You yeah. think that's an act? It is. I no offense, D. No offense, D. But I don't think... Oh, no, no offense, No offense, D. I'm going to go there on this one. What black man you know is just going to dance something, and walk up into a restaurant yelling and screaming and all that stuff? Claiming that he's gonna do this and do that to him without him getting arrested. <laughs> well, because he didn't press charges. He said he didn't press charges. Man, listen, security would have came in there and arrested him without him arrested, pressing charges. You know that. It was no, any, anybody man. else. And what about uh, the motorboat? He knocked him off the <laughs> motorboat. Well, that was funny. That was funny. <laughs> okay, and he's in Jeremy right now. They won't let him go to none. They won't let him go nowhere near Shannon Brink. See, I think, I think, I think a lot I mean, of that is just an act. I think a lot of that. because no, look, I think if, if he gets in the ring with Klitschko, Klitschko is gonna he's gonna eventually stop him. First of all, Briggs don't only score, he only throws about ten, fifteen punches around. 
I think and we all know he's about, by, by, the, he by the fifth or sixth round in phase. Ain't nothing wrong with that. By the fifth or sixth round in phase. You know what? I'd probably rather see that Shannon Briggs fight than anybody else that Klitsch okay, goes for. Okay, at least he'll come to fight. Yeah, yeah he'd, get, he'd, get, he'd get absolutely hammered like they all do, but it'd at least be fun in the press conference and give it a few rounds, wouldn't it? Well, Klitschko has said he wants that WBC belt, so I would like to see him fight this winner of Stavern and uh, Wilder. Yeah, I'd yeah. Like to see he's him. A, yeah. Yeah, and then after that he can fight Shannon Briggs so he can go on by his business, go into retirement, happy man with a couple million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> one, just one, I think yeah. it's about 300 million, isn't it? Yeah. One more fight before we uh, close the show. Uh, fight that's going to be on HBO Latino, actually, as uh, another fighter um, I've talked about a lot over the past couple of years as a super middleweight by the name of Gilberto Ramirez, um, tall 6'2 southpaw who can really crack. Um, he has skill. Uh, we don't know about his chin yet or anything like that. He hasn't fought the best opposition, but he's going to be fighting uh, for Hensil Zuniga. Um, in San Antonio. I don't know if any of you guys have seen him, but if you have, because uh, I think Ramirez is virtually, he's going to be the future at 168 pounds. Um, and I'm saying right now, I think in the next two years, um, he's going to win a world title. Uh, if any of you guys have seen him, uh, your thoughts on Gilberto Ramirez? I, I have seen him, yeah. Um... He's one of these guys at the moment, isn't he, that just looks, he looks really dangerous, you know, he's like a Thurman or a Golovkin, he looks, he looks like he's the real deal. I mean, he's, but, destroy, he's destroying cats. He is, he is, but again, look at, look at the resume, he's not for anybody. Um, so for me, he's still unproven, yes, he's, he's, he looks like a knockout guy, he looks like he's quite skilled. But you know what? You put him in with a top guy like a Ward or a Frotch, and these guys get found out. So let's let's wait and see. The jury's out for me. He's fighting Zuniga in his next fight, who's who's average himself, I think. Um, so I don't think we'll find out too much there. I think he'll yeah. beat him well. But let's let's wait and see when he gets in there with uh, maybe a Groves or a Darrell or a De Gale, um, someone like that, and let's see if he can do it against them. Yeah, that's but, why I say in the next two years because uh, he still gets in season and he still needs to fight a, a tough quality guy, much in the same way that Kell Brook fought. Um, oh, gosh, what's the guy that Kell Brook fought that gave him? No, before, before he had the title shot. Um, oh, Sengchenko. Um, Jones. Carson Jones. Oh, Carson Jones, yeah, yeah. I think he needs that kind of opponent still, but um, I'll go to you on this one, D. Have you seen Gilberto Ramirez fight? And if you have your assessment of him. Are you there, D? Yeah, 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 yeah. I have me on mute. No, I, I'm saying, listen, I'm trying to look him up. Now, I've never seen him. You know, I'm a HBO Showtime or pay per view. If they ain't on them, I have time. I don't know who they are. I ain't going to lie to you. Yeah, he's fought on Friday Night Fights a few times. And his uh, fight coming oh. on Saturdays will be on um, HBO Latino. Uh, Can't speak on what I don't know. I, I have no idea. Unless I see him, I, the name is not registered. Well, he's going to um, step up into the mix this year, isn't he? Because the way that it's looking, I think if Frotch ends up uh, vacating his IBF belt um, and De Gale beats Periban, De Gale is going to be fighting. Yeah, De Gale's going to be fighting Ramirez, I think, for the IBF title probably summer this year. Oh. That's a good fight. That's a good fight. Um, yeah. Provide, providing, obviously, Ramirez beats Zuniga and... Uh, which I think he will quite easily. He will, he will. And De Gale will probably beat Paraban. So that is apparently uh, going to be for the vacant IBF title, which will be vacated in the next month by Frotch, I believe. I also heard some interesting news today from um, Eddie Hearn. And he was saying that, that Frotch is now talking about a fight with Golovkin in the summer. Really? Yeah. He's saying if this Chavez thing doesn't come off, apparently because Al Heyman now got Chavez and it's all a bit of a mess, 
the Chavez fight isn't going to happen. But Cole's been talking a lot about Golovkin recently and um, he said it wouldn't surprise him if he turns around and says, yeah, let's do it. Okay, cool. Hey, Mike, do said send him a link. Hold on. Do said send him a link. Okay, let me check. Let me check. Uh, Say something brown. I'm I looking. Okay. Uh, for that, um, cool. D, your thoughts on the potential fight between uh, Carl Frosch and uh, Triple G since unboxing at wow, it? Wow, that would be a cool fight, man. I, I, I don't know if you know I like Triple G, but Carl Frosch got a equal crack too, man. When he dropped, kept, <coughs> when he dropped Groves, I just knew Groves was going to come back and beat him, but shit, he made me a believer. <laughs> I have no idea. You know? Shoot. And Groves keep calling him out like, why? <laughs> I know, he wants to get knocked out again. <laughs> yeah, I know Gross. He looked good in his last fight. Um, he, we, I'm going to have to um, holler at him next week because we're getting ready to shut the show down. So I'm sorry to the guest, to the guy who wants to. Yeah, I'm sorry to the guy who, who wants to be on, but we're about to shut the show down. Well, I'll try to have him on um, within the next couple of weeks. Uh, but. When, um, not his, pr it was a comment, I'll go to you on this one, Addy. It was a comment by Frosh when asked about Triple G, um, and it came off as Frosh didn't want to fight him. Comments made earlier this year, um, this spring, um, not the, during the previous fight with Triple G when she fought, uh, but the previous fight on um, this past spring, uh, Clarify on those comments in terms of what Frost said initially about a fight with Triple G because it sounded like he was Frost was saying to Triple G he's just too tough and I don't want to get in the ring with a guy that tough. Well, yeah, this comment that Cole Frost made was uh, it was actually in a Facebook interview and he said it with a little bit of tongue in cheek really. Uh, he was asked, you know, what about Golovkin and he said, "Oh, swerve him. He's he's dangerous. He punches like a mule or something like that." Um, now, as you, as you know, Michael, I'm from Nottingham, and I know Carl, and I've seen him a couple of times over the last half year or so, and I asked him about it, and he said it was just a throwaway comment. He said if if HBO put that fight on in Vegas, if they thought it was big enough to have in Vegas, he'd fight him now instead of Chavez. So it, this is something that HBO, I think, were trying to build up. I think they put that statement on after a Golovkin fight or something like that. But Cole, Cole will still fight anybody in the world. It's nothing to do with um, uh, you know, him retiring and stuff like that. He wants one more fight in Vegas. Now, if Ward comes out of retirement or semi-retirement and is big enough to put a big fight on in Vegas, he'd fight Ward. He's not, he's not bothered, but the Chavez fight is the one that is realistic at the moment because HBO wants it and Chavez has got so many Mexican fans, etc. That's the only reason they're talking about Chavez, but um, oh, oh, I would love to see that, that Golovkin fight. Froch versus Golovkin, I probably it's the fight I want to see in world boxing more than any else, actually. Two absolute beasts going at it and we'd finally see whether Golovkin is the real deal because he had not been in there with anybody like Froch. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think on the show, on, on that note, we're going to sh um, shut the show down and close things down. Um, I'll go to you on this one, D. Uh, for folks who want to get in contact with you and talk boxing, otherwise, anything else, cooking, <laughs> let the folks know where they can hit you up at. Uh, sorry. Um, YouTube. Hit me up on YouTube. I got my own blog, Do the Brown Show. You can hit me on Facebook. I got couple pages on there, Barbie Boxing Forum, the Duty Brown Show. See where I'm going with this, the Duty Brown, Duty Brown Show. <laughs> so uh, hit me up, man. I do whatever and put whatever upload. I don't care. I got a lot of time on my hands. Yeah, she talks boxing. She talks food. She talks and reality TV, throwing up recipes. She does it all. <laughs> uh, Mr. Boxing Manic, uh let the folks know. Let the folks know. <laughs> Let the folks know where they can uh, find you to talk boxing or anything else. 
Well, I'm uh, yeah, I'm on you. I'm on YouTube. You can get me at Mr. Boxing Addict. Um, I'm not really into the Twitter and all that, as I've said before. But uh, yeah, you can get me on there. But I'll definitely be subscribing to Doodoo's. Getting some rest. I'm on YouTube, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, y'all know where to find me. Y'all know what it is. Um, For sure, my bro- Brother JR, Brother JR on our Twitter. Um, if you want to find out more about the Pound for Pound Boxing Report, again, you can go to the blog page, p4pboxingreport.wordpress.com. You can also go to the podcast page, p4pboxingreport.podomag.com. On the uh, blog page, you can find episodes of the Pound for Pound Boxing Report YouTube show, uh, podcasts, as well as articles and videos and whatever written by yours truly. Um, on the podcast page, you can find um, previous all previous episodes of Pound Pound Box Report podcast. Both of those pages as well find links will give provide you links to find us all over social media, Facebook, Google Plus, Twitter, Tumblr, Pinterest, uh, YouTube, uh, RSS feed where you can subscribe, Stitcher Radio, yes we're on Stitcher Radio as well as links to donate your account. Um, on the next episode of Pound for Pound Box Report, we will do a recap of Klitschko and Pulev. Uh, we may talk about Gamerto Ramirez, his fight with Zuniga. Uh, we will also do a preview of uh, the bout between Manny Pacquiao and Chris Algieri. It's going to be happening in Macau. Um, that's a big card. Uh, we may also talk about the rematch uh, between Cleverly and Tony Bellew. Bad blood between both guys. Um, I think it's a pretty significant bout over in England. It's getting a lot of buzz because of the Patriots being talked back and forth right at it. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, they don't like each other. Those two. That's going to be a real, real, real good fight. Actually, there's a lot of um, a lot of talk about it being a pay-per-view show, and not a lot of the British fans aren't happy about it. But on that same card, you've got the Gale Perriban, you've got Groves against Dufflin, you've got Jamie McDonald, Scott Quigg in World Championship fights, and Tim Josh was there. So it's going to be a good card. That one. I I, I rate it actually. Yeah. So we'll talk about that card as well as the Pacquiao Jerry and that card um, as uh, the Silver Machenko. He's going to be defending his featherweight belt as well on that card. Um, Jesse Vargas, Jesse Vargas fighting Antonio DeMarco. Also, Zhu Shiming is going to be fighting on that card. So we'll be talking about those uh, two uh, card, two uh, cards mainly um, for my gu- for my guest, uh, the one and only Dudu Brown, uh, Mr. Boxing Addict, joining us live from the UK. Um, I am your host, Michael. This has been another episode of the Pound for Pound Box Report. You guys have a good evening. Good night.